Hi everybody, this is a module for the Biasics and Ability Studies course, also to be used for the Chance International Youth Peace Ambassador Training Workshop, and to be used in general for the program of Ability Studies, the course of Ability Studies at the American University for Server Nations. The title is Anticipatory Governance Through an Ability Studies Lens, the issue of Ability Expectation Governance. I will for now on not show you the video again. You saw how I look like. Now it's audio, so it doesn't take away the space. These are my students, this interdisciplinary student research team. There's a link. I urge you to go there. They're doing some cool stuff. This is their logo. They designed even the PowerPoint template is designed by them. So it's just an amazing group working on all kinds of topics, as you will see in the next slide. Here you see my group in more overview. We cover many topics, as you can see, from A to W, covering as different things like aging well, anticipate governance, artificial womb, autism, all the way down to synthetic biology, sport, sustainability, and water. Um, on the bottom left, um, on the bottom picture, the left one is Lucy Deep, my master student, and the right one in the picture is Bushra Abdullah. The middle picture on the right is Vernon Leopatra, who generated the logo for this group and the name, coined the name on the right, Natalie Ball, a member of the group. And then the top picture, some of uh, in my backyard, you can see here uh, how many people were so far part of group. Some even, some even join, also they are supervised by other people, simply because they want to be part of the group. And we have uh, Stephanie Montesanti, who uh, is an as the postdoc, who is like co-facilitating with me to give some other um, knowledge to the group, some other views, and so this is really a slide for thanking my students. I really think they are doing exceptional work. Many of them are undergraduate students. Actually, most of them are undergraduate students. Some of them starting all the way back right in year one when they come out of high school and they do amazing work. So I have to thank them. This module in essence asks questions such as which ability expectations should drive a given science and technology product process and its governance? What is the impact of any given science and technology process product on ability security? And what is the impact of a given s and on self-identity security? Disability studies I already explained. Now, ability studies goes beyond. It really looks in general at the dynamics around ability expectation, a one stage and ableism, a need stage, and the impact on human, 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 animal, and human nature relationships. Now, the term ableism evolved from the disability rights movement in the United States and Britain during the 1960s and 1970s. As used within the disability rights movement and disability studies, it questions the expectation of species typical linked abilities while labeling subspecies typical abilities as deficient, as impaired, as often undesirable, and leading often to the accompanying disabilism, the lack of accommodation, enthusiasm for the needs of people and other biological structures who are seen to not have certain abilities the unwillingness to adapt to the needs of others. However, ableism goes beyond body ability expectations. Ableism as such also is not negative. It just highlights that one favors certain abilities and sees them as essential. One could have a positive slate on abilities, expectations, ableism, like saying this, that one sees, for example, equity as essential. So, Ableism is one of the most societal entrenched and accepted isms, and one of the biggest enablers for other isms. For example, sexism is often justified by certain ability expectations. Like in the Western countries, women weren't allowed to vote because they were told that they are not rational, so they don't have the ability of rationality. In the US, we had the Bell Curve, which is a book which in essence says, I mean, certain ethnic groups are more cognitive able than others. A, right, casteism, ageism, ageism where we say, well, the elderly don't have the abilities we expect from them anymore. Speciesism, often linked to it. There's a whole stuff around 
um, different ability expectation for anthropocentric versus biocentric understanding of how we interact with nature. And I have another module on eco-ableism. Then gross domestic product, GDPism is an ability expectation, consumerism, productivity, competitiveness. And it goes on. In essence, right, we as people make numerous decisions every day based on ability expectations we have. Ability expectations are linked to value, labeling, conflict, choice, identity, motivational achievement, goal, self-determination, neo-institutional body and social constructivism theories. Ability expectations are linked to the cultural reality of disableism, experienced by entities labeled as lacking essential abilities, such as not fulfilling ability expectations of the one setting the ability expectation agenda. As such, ability expectation adds to the labeling theory discourse, which focuses on the linguistic tendency of majorities to label negatively minorities or those seen as deviant from norms. Value theory records what people do value and attempts to understand why they value certain things. Expectancy value theory of achievement motivation, the ability desired, is used to analyze dynamics of various discourses. Conflict theory emphasizes possible conflicts between social groups. Groups of people with different ability expectations are often in conflict with each other. Finally, one chooses between different abilities, which can be classified as a social choice problem. The ability expectation we choose, whether as individuals or as another social entity, impact and are impacted by S and T. Essex code theories and principles are intended to help society to deal with emerging issues, such as the governance of scientific and technological advancements. They are linked integrally to abilities needed to make a given ethics code, theory, or principle operational. A given ethics theory code or principle privileges certain abilities, and as such, its uptake correlates with the privileging of certain ability expectations. Privileging certain ability expectations were and are one trigger for the development of ethics theories, codes, and principle. So in the next couple of slides, I simply highlight some science and technology development. And this quote is, seems right, very telling. I could just give you the translation because I can't speak French. Tools and machines are kind of organs, and organs are kind of tools or machines. Now, in the next couple of slides, I simply show pictures, and um, with some I will say something, with some I won't. This, in essence, are my legs, which I, well, this is my latest version I had when I was 18. Um, I don't use them anymore because I find the wheelchair and crawling a better combination than the legs. Um, and you can see there are mostly the teddy bears in there. Indeed, you can see here the legs really moved on. These are the cheetah legs used by different people. Exoskeleton is another version because uh, obviously um, one does not want to eliminate legs of people so they can have the superior cheetah legs, um, right? Legs which I, by now, I mean, for example, these toys and some others who wear them, I can outrun uh, high performance athletes. With, with normal legs, so-called normal legs, species typical legs. These are exoskeletons where you will simply go in, used by military and for other purposes. Um, here you see another exoskeleton, and here you also see the first problem we have, because we really see increasingly uh, competition or hierarchy of assistive devices. Here the narrative is, you know, a wheelchair you have exoskeleton, now you walk again, so you're liberated from your wheelchair. Of course, that's rather problematic um, because there are a lot of people who never will be using an exoskeleton, whether they're due to right, how their body is structured or monetary issues and so on. So to play this game, to play one device against another, highly, highly problematic from a disability studies perspective. And reality as a person, in, actually as in the moment in the wheelchair, would be much further ahead and can go to so many more places than actually as an exoskeleton. So it's not even overstating the case. Here's another example of overstating a disclaimer in essence from the um, 
World Championship, Soccer World Championship in Brazil, where oh, there's a wheelchair and no right your ex-skeleton and you could kick the ball. Um, but reality is, yeah, the same applies. Here again about soccer, and you can see that this is now not an assistive device. It seems to be we just modify humans so we get better legs, so we can actually play better soccer. Interestingly enough, is this came from Puma, so this is like a where it sells a lot of soccer shoes. And it's also interesting that, of course, we have at the moment a big controversy on germline modifications, um, right, where we right, could achieve this down the road. This is an interesting one. This is, a, in essence, was a conference in 2001 organized by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Commerce in the US. And it was about, I mean, finding a niche for nanotechnology. So they coined, in essence, the term conversion technology, linking nano to bio to information technology and cognitive sciences, MBIC. And they could have chosen any topic, but they chose improving human performances. That, in essence, so, right, was using different technologies to improve human performances. And keep this in mind, this is not about therapeutic applications per se. And this is synthetic biology, a recently emerged field, um, which is about the design and construction of new biological parts, devices, and systems, and the redesign of existing natural biological systems for useful purposes. These are some ideas around what one can do with um, synthetic biology, humans that photosynthesize, new biological pathways, reversal of aging, disease fighting, implantable living batteries for medical devices, beneficial bacterial infection program to augment immunity, cybernetics, self-repaired bodies, programmed organisms, changing behavior, programmable pets, biological robots, synthesis, eukaryotic cells, living self-repaired materials. Now, synthetic biology as Right, modifying, I mean, genomes, building genomes from scratch. We are, of course, in the moment only on the uh, rudimentary um, low biological or organism level. If it ever comes to a human level that we do this, I mean, where like its first pathway changes through um, somatic and germline genetic enhancement. Even, but even there, um, playing around a lot might not be so feasible as long as we have to use humans to test out whether something really w worked, right? I mean, one can go for embryos and IVF, but even that is not very useful um, for testing, given that IVF success rate is, I think, around 10%. But if an artificial womb came along, and definitely a lot of people working on it, then one could, in essence, uh, right, circumvent humans as an incubator, and then use right away, right, in a mechanical incubator, and then one can see whether whatever one designed actually works. So if this two come together, I think we will have quite a few issues around uh, human enhancement on a genetic level. So that might not be here yet, but I mean, there's all the time the news that we are nearly there with the artificial womb that we're already in the fifth month stage, so not much longer. So we have to see when that comes and then how synthetic biology, but I mean, develops. But there recently were a lot of news around germline uh, modifications, right? Uh, and there's a lot of controversy over whether it should go forward or not. And so there's definitely, I mean, a lot of stuff going on, right, scientifically, where we have to see where that goes. Now let's get to the topic of governance and anticipatory governance of science and technology. Anticipate governance aims to understand the potential social, ethical, and political impacts of emerging discourses. It entails foresight, constructing plausible socio-technical implications, integration, bringing together diverse fields such as social science and natural sciences, and engagement, bringing together public citizens, developers, engineers, policymakers, and other actors to construct conversations around awareness, reaction, and knowledge development and sharing. Uh, this stuff is, I mean, from David Gustin. The reference is below. Need for anti governance of ability, expectation, and ableism is one facet, we, I posit, of anticipate governance. I should 
highlight that Lucy Deep, my master student of in the moment, works exactly on the anticipatory governance angle and looks at it how that is working and what are the pitfalls for marginalized populations. She is focusing on disability rights organizations in the moment. Question is whether governance as such is even still wanted. Here is, for example, a little snippet from Scientific America, where in essence highlights that there is a discourse in the US whether we really need social science research, which governance would be part of it. Here is just a, a link to an article which is around this. Again, what kind of science should be funded and whether we should go right, in essence, um, for social sciences and in what way. Right. One question under under the governance is really which ability expectations drive a given s and Here's, for example, a 2006 Association for the Advancement of Science workshop looked into the dynamic of human enhancement and concluded that the following ability desires are the main drivers for human enhancements. To keep one's local and global competitive advantage, to live securely and to maintain one's quality of life and one's consumer lifestyle. Right, the NBIC report, which I already mentioned, I mean, uses terms such as productivity over 60 times, efficiency 54 times, and competitiveness 29 times to sell their message. One question one can ask around the ability to take governance is what is the impact of any given ST on ability security? Ability security means that one is able to live a secure life with whatever set of abilities one has and that one will not be forced to have a prescribed set of abilities to live a secure life. For example, even if one doesn't have the ability to work, he or she should be able to secure employment. Ability security is, I would put that, and I made this case in 2010, is part, should be part of the WHO framework of human security, which consists of economic, food, health, environmental, personal, community, and political security. Here's just one example on the lack of ability security. I had the same figure in the module on disability studies and the situation of people with disabilities or disabled people. This is the US census on US data on employment status. And this is linked to disability as one of them. And you can see here the important number is the participation rate, which is 18.2% for January 2015 and 19.6% for January 2015 with person with disability, meaning 19.6% of disabled people are in the workforce as of January 2015. This correlates with 68.2% in the general population. The unemployment numbers don't mean much. They say here 11.9% versus 5.9% for so-called non-disabled people. But that number only counts people who are looking for work and can't find work. That's the number people normally hear about. But the majority of disabled people do not even look for work. So, so the ratio of non-work to population is, for example, 82% of disabled people and 35% for non, so-called non-disabled people. So. The numbers are, in essence, with other words, 80% of disabled people don't work. That's the US. The numbers, pretty sure, will be similar in other countries. Um, right? There's no reason why the US should be worse off than others. In some places, it might be even worse. But in reality, it's, I mean, only 20% work. When you go to the module on disability studies and the situation of disabled people, you find more about it, like based on severity and so on. So. Um, but that would not fit here. So please have a look at the other module. Thanks. Another question one can ask under governance of s and is what the impact is on ability inequality and ability inequity. For both ability inequality and ability inequity, terms I coined in 2010, two versions exist. One focuses on the body, and one focuses on the ability impact of a given product, right? For example, ability inequality is a descriptive term denoting any uneven distribution of access to and protection from abilities generated through human intervention, right or wrong. 
And this generated through human intervention could be any, for example, science theory product, whether it's weapons, whether it's um, geoengineering, right? The list goes on. As to the body, ability inequality is a descriptive term denoting any uneven judgment of abilities intrinsic to biological structures, such as the human body, right or wrong. And here's about the body, so it's linked to self-identity security, covered also in the disability studies module and in the model from disability studies to ability studies, the meaning of, of health, disease, health, disability, and rehabilitation. Um, and it's really about, do you have a right, right to be who you are, or are you judged based on the abilities you have, right? your body has, for example. And then ability inequity has the same two ones, it's just a normative instead of descriptive term. All right, another question one can ask is, what is the impact of a given s and on self-identity security? I mentioned self-identity security in the last slide around ability, inequity, and inequality. Self-identity security is a term also I coined in 2010. You see the reference below. and could be seen as a subset of personal security, which is part of the WHO human security setup and means that one is accepted with one set of abilities and that one should not be forced physically or by circumstance to accept a perception of oneself one does not agree with. For example, one is not expected to have the ability to walk or that one has to accept that the label of a deficient product if one cannot work. However, if we look, for example, at the academic literature of social robotics or brain machine brain computer interfaces, the language is nearly exclusively following a medical understanding of disabled people and the purpose of restoration. The narratives are not indicating the ability expectation of decreasing the social discrimination ability diverse pe people experience. So I don't think that there's really a self-identity security available. It will, because they're in essence setting the narrative of patient around disabled people of certain abilities. <laughs> That's covered in Wolbing and Deep below and Yumakulov. Jürgens and Wolbring. Uh, another issue of anticipated governance, especially around ability expectation governance, is who is involved. Um, I don't talk a lot about the involvement of disabled people. Also, we published a piece in Nano Essex around disabled people. Oh, involved in governance of technology within the Asian setting. Um, the reference is below. Um, but this is more rel relating to professions, right? For example, social work, we publish this reference also below. And in essence shows that social work, so far when we look at academic databases, we can't find really any engagement of the social work literature with emerging technologies such as social robots or brain machine interfaces or human enhancement or neurocognitive enhancement, but also not anything around technological governments, governments of technology. That social work is not involved in the anticipated governance or in general right, in, of new emerging technologies is rather surprising and because when we're looking at the vision of purpose of social work education, and this comes from the paper we published. Facilitating the transaction between individuals and the environment for purpose of problem solving, empowerment, to promote recovery, store individuals, families, and community well-being, enhance development of each individual power in control over his or her life and advance principle of social justice, addressing need in the light of people lived experience to advocate for and or with people changes in those policies and structural conditions that maintain people in marginalized, dispossessed and vulnerable positions, to enhance people's well-being, to increase betterment of living condition of a client, a family or a community, understand the mechanism of oppression and discrimination, apply strategies of advocacy and social change to advance social justice. That means, seems to be, at least to me, that social work has to be involved in the governance of technologies, especially emerging ones, and especially anticipatory before, in essence, the problems are arising to flag the problems a, a new product could have potentially. 
uh, have a look at the full paper. Uh, also, the paper itself is not open access. There's a link on my university website which gives you a pre version which has most of the same uh, text. It's not just social work which seems not to be present. If we're using, for example, now here terms like occupational therapy, physical therapy, or rehabilitation engineering, and then we use the term technology governance and governance of technology, uh, there is in essence no hits. And this is, I mean, really issues because with governance, right? If we are, when you look at the module of from disability studies to ability studies, the meaning of health, disability, and rehab, which talks a lot about enhancement of right abilities through new technologies beyond the species typical. Really, the question here is who will be the future client of OT, PT, rehab engineering? Will their future client be the ones who want to be enhanced? Will they serve the enhanced healthy or the improved impaired first? Which means that we are right, um, we having healthy people and they get enhancement products. Or we're using right, or we give products, I mean, to impaired people in the old ways to improve them to the species typical, which would be cure, maybe called curative medicine. That's how I call this in the other module. Whereas enhancement, enhanced healthy, I call it enhancement medicine. Will they lobby for enhancement beyond the normal for as impaired perceived people? Um, there are papers I wrote this also in the other module. Um, a one is looking at the views of members of the World Federation of the Deaf. Right, deaf people, and then the other one of rehab educators who look into helping disabled people, guiding them, advising them on jobs and where to go. And both papers, in essence, say that people will go for the enhancement. Will these professions lobby against enhancement for the healthy due to the impact on the well being of the so called impaired? Because if we enhance the healthy, then we might see the same disablement. Right, we see the moment of the, the so-called um, subspecies typical impaired. Um, they experiencing by the species typical healthy, because then the species typical could be seen as the new impaired, right, as the techno poor impaired, and then they might get disabled by the ones who have the enhancement. Right, who will shape in essence the governance of S&T? Right. Will it be the OTs, the PTs, the rehab engineering, the social workers? Who of the professions are actually part of it? Definitely important question around anticipated governance. Another issue one has to look at under anticipated governance and governance of ability expectation is right, what is expected from the public ability-wise. Indeed, I mean, one makes certain assumption what abilities the public has the so-called public, um, to take part in anticipated governance processes. And one has to ask some question. Who has to provide for the societal environment that allows one to take part? Who has the ability to provide? Who provides the information to whom and in which way? Who has the ability to access the information? Who has the ability to know early enough that one has to be informed so that one can influence the anticipated governance discourse of, for example, cognitive new enhancement before the trajectory is already set? Who has the ability to get involved and is not hindered by the struggle of daily life, which might give little room for other endeavors? Is the reaching out happening in such a way that one has the ability to understand the issues? These are just some questions. Um, have a look. I mean, at um, some of the references we already, I already gave, the one from Wolverine and Deep under with Oxford University Press um, deals with some of that. Um, the social robotics paper by Deep, Jurgens, and Wolverine is looking at some of that. But these are questions one has to, I mean, answer. It's not that simple just to involve people. This was a conference in Switzerland, which I attended, where I um, showed the film Fixed, the movie, the science slash fiction of human enhancement. The film was very well received, but it was definitely that, I mean, some speakers really behaved and saw the audience, which was coming from the membership of the Disability Service Organization, Pro Infirmis, who is the biggest service organization 
for disabled people in Switzerland, really more like consumers as potential clients. Um, right? And they were definitely minimizing the social consequences uh, on the topic, um, very um, right, problematic, how we engage with people. And so if we want to give them the tools, we also have to give them the information in such a way that they can really be part of a governance process. Um, so not every speaker for sure was, I mean, treating them as a group of potential governance experts who give advice on how to govern these technologies, but really just as consumers. Luckily, there were others there who took, I mean, a more, um, right, really participatory design where it's not just about participatory consumerism, but participatory governance. Um, but we don't, we have so far very few out there around human enhancement, which is covered by disability service organizations and outside of a consumer product uh, angle. So there's a lot of challenges uh, out there. We can't uh, write and just governance is not just happening and involving the public does not just happen either. Given that we have so many products, it seems to be less every day is a new product one should look at. Um, the question is really who has the time and so on. See last question. I should say that after having being part of the Poor Infirmers Conference, it was a very nice conference. Um, the organizers um, and very good questions by the, in essence, audience who came from their circles. Um, so kudos to them. Interestingly, I think this angle of ability expectation might also be a solution to certain voices certain ethicists have. For example, Sherwin recently stated, we ethicists, lacks the appropriate intellectual tools for promoting deep moral change in our society. I submit that understanding ability expectation dynamics, ability privileging dynamic is essential for understanding how to make a real difference. Ethical reasoning and the use of ethic theories per se does not lead people or institutions to changes. Change in ability expectations, change in ability privileging are the levers of social and political change, I submit. Indeed, when we, for example, did interviews with disabled, I mean, parents of disabled children on certain topics um, like new enhancement, we found that also, of course, I use, I have a lot of concerns which one would cover in ethics discourses like privacy and so on. They simply do not use the language of ethics. They don't use, I mean, ethics theories, they don't use our ethics principles. They use just much more down to earth ability expectations like, okay, what happens if my kid now has to do X, Y, Z, and that means they can't get employment. So much more down to earth when I think this ability expectation is the lens one can use to connect with people and not stuck with a language which really no one is using on the ground. I want to leave you with something. This is a quote. This is in essence a conversation between Alex D and Paul Denton, two characters in the game Deus Ex Invisible War, which came, which what came out in 2003. Paul Denton. If you want to even out the social order, you have to change the nature of power itself, right? And what creates power? Wealth, physical strength, legislation, maybe. But none of those is the root principle of power. Alex D, I'm listening. Paul Denton, ability is the idea that drives the modern state. It's a synonym for one's worth, one's social reach, one's election in the biblical sense. And it is the idea that needs to be changed if people are to begin living as equals. Alex D, and you think you can equalize humanity with biomodification? Paul Denton, the commodification of ability, tuition of course, but increasingly genetic treatment, cybernetic protocols, now biomods, has had the side effect of creating a self-perpetuating aristocracy in all advanced societies. When ability becomes a public resource, what will distinguish people will be what they do with it. Intention, dedication, and integrity, the qualities we should choose as a bedrock of the social order. It's interesting that there's a game who covered this 
where we really, what I really say, would say, we need not just governance of technology, what we need is the governance of ability expectations. We need to look into who has the power to decide which abilities are important and which aren't, and what it means for the ones who don't have the abilities. And indeed, we're having something like an ability aristocracy, right? It's not right. So I think this is, I mean, the main thing. And so disability studies is a field which looked at some forms of ability expectation, which then led to a disablement of the people who are seen as lacking them. That's why they coined the term ableism. But they are, in essence, this, I mean, it's interesting. If this term would have been coined by the women's movement, like the ableism term, and question would be would have been used as a narrative to question um, right the women to right question that we don't allow women to vote in, in certain times and in certain places because of we give them certain abilities, right? We think are undesirable or tell them right they don't have certain abilities they need. The academic fields would have right covering women issues and gender issues would have been all over using the term. But because it came out of disability studies, it was hardly picked up, if at all. I mean, this shows you how, how ghettoized disability studies is. And that's why, in essence, I generated ability studies, because I think this is crucial. Ability expectation lead to ability, right, are what drives things. Right? Ability expectation oppression is, right, one of the main consequences um, right, of ability expectation, power of certain groups, and the disablement is really an ability expectation oppression. These are two cartoons from David Werner. One, of course, is Nothing About Us Without Us. The slogan came out of South Africa, but it really still highlights that actually a lot of disabled people are not part of the discourse and not with their own views, identities, and so on. And you can it's more about it in the governance one module and in the um, disability studies, the situation of disabled people module. And it's not being normal that's important, but learning to accept our being different, to live and love as fully as we can, and let live. That, I think, is a very important message. Um, and th that's very simply not our. And that will then, of course, if we're not there, then that's how we'll, right, the enhancement stuff might play itself out in very negative ways. If we do not have, as I said in the disability studies module, if we don't have ability security, which means that I can have an outcome, a living wage, a life, a good life, even if I don't have certain abilities, and if I don't have self-identity security that I can perceive myself as I want to perceive myself. Without that, I think there will be huge problems. We're moving more and more. We move the gouge curve more and more to higher abilities, and we will see a lot of new marginalized groups. And, that's will, and this is a global issue that will play itself out differently in different cultures. Who will be gone first? Which enhancements will we go first for? Which ones will be the first ones to get marginalized who weren't marginalized before? This is not a North American thing, this is not a Western thing, this is everywhere um, and just will play itself off differently in different places. So this is now the end of this module, talking about anticipated governance. I want to like to thank Lucy Deep, my master's student, who works on the topic, who does some great work. You saw some of the references of stuff which is already published, some which is under accepted and some which under, is under review, which I didn't put there, but will, more will come. And so you can see the publication page where a lot of stuff you can download, a lot of stuff is open access. If you can't access something, feel free to contact me. If you have questions, also contact me based on this PowerPoint and the, the, the audio and based on what you read in the articles. I look forward to your questions and so on by email and so on. Thank you. Take care. Have a nice day.